Welcome to LINK 2023. I'm Francisca Dorn from the University of Bonn, New Interventionist, and it's my pleasure to introduce Karen Doyle. She's a professor at University of Galway in Ireland. Welcome, Karen. Thanks, Francisca. So, Karen, I would like to ask you a little bit about the Restore and the Excellent Registry. Maybe you can summarize what this is and what your work is. So the Restore Registry is a registry that we've uh, worked on in, in University of Galway since uh, 2017. And within it, we've, we've worked with clinical collaborators uh, throughout Europe in, in, in Dublin, also in uh, Gothenburg, in Budapest and in Athens. And between them, our collaborators actually collected a thousand cases um, and with, we were sent the clot per pass which enabled us to actually look at the heterogeneity per pass, which was extremely valuable. Um, and what we, what we found is that there is in fact a difference in uh, per pass composition with the more difficult to remove clots um, being more white, so containing less red blood cells, more um, platelets and also collagen. Um, in terms of the, the excellent registry, um, that registry actually um, uses the Embotrap as the, the first uh, port of call. And within this, it's again a very large registry. Um, and my lab was involved in the analysis of the clot composition. Um, and we observed that the uh, typical red blood cell percentage of the clots collected uh, through the excellent registry was actually very similar to the overall uh, red blood cell composition of the clots in the Restore registry but the Restore registry samples were collected using a variety of techniques so a mix of stent retrievers and aspiration and the whole range. Okay very interesting and is there any any influence on where the clot comes from? Uh, does this influence the, the clot composition? Or? So we looked at clot etiologies in the, the TOAST classification system and uh, the the main difference actually is in the large artery atherosclerotic clots. So we have observed that they are more rich in red blood cells than the other uh, type of classifications. Um, so there's significantly more red blood cells uh, in comparison to cardioembolic, for example, uh, and uh, cardioembolic clots have significantly higher levels of uh, the whiter components, so the, the fibrin and also the platelets. And the cryptogenic clots quite resemble the cardioembolic clots. So they're probably the tougher clots then? Yes, I, I, it would appear so. Yes, yes, for sure. I'm interested, Francesca, from the clinical perspective, um, what do you think is a difficult to remove clot? Yeah, a difficult clot is normally they're white, they're very sticky, um, they're sometimes difficult to pass with the microwire and microcatheter and they give us very hard times to retrieve them. So normally if you have already done two or three passes, you know this is not a normal clot, this is a difficult clot. This is what we, what we learned during the procedure and this is one reason why we sometimes fail. And do you, do you trust your gut or how is it that you predict that something might actually be a difficult to remove clot? Yeah, you never can. Sometimes, as you said, cardiac embolic uh, thrombi, uh, more fibrin rich, more um, platelet rich. So if a patient has atrial fibrillation, for instance, then you know this is going to be probably a little bit tougher than uh, other cases. Um, but all the other features that were evaluated, as far as I know, except for clot calcification on CT scan, uh, do not really predict um, the, the, the kind of clot or the clot composition. So clot length, uh, appearance of the, of the occlusion, all this doesn't really help us. And, and if you do suspect that it might be a difficult to remove clot, what, what are your options then? I think you should, what you should not be doing is um, you should not uh, continue with your standard technique. You should change your technique. And one option is you could uh, use the Nimbus device, uh, which has been designed especially for tough clots, for fibrin rich clots. And um, this, this is, I think, very interesting because this is not another stent retriever. Um, so I wouldn't change to another stent retriever. I would um, probably take the, the Nimbus, I normally take the Nimbus, and, uh, and, and, and try to get it out, yes. What's the evidence that the Nimbus device is useful for difficult to remove clots? 
Yeah, we now have some uh, evidence. There are two single center studies uh, that were published. They both had 50% uh, or over 50% extra chance after failure with another device. And there's also one study that um, uh, included first pass Nimbus cases and uh, uh, Nimbus uh, after failed from back with other devices. And they had about 78% um, uh, good recognition success. And we will soon have the data of the Spiro uh, registry. Um, so this is a prospective uh, multi-center European um, registry where Nimbus was only used after failure of one or two passes with another device. And uh, they had over 50% recognition success with the first pass uh, with the Nimbus. I think this is very nice. So um, to summarize, over 50% extra chance for the patient after you failed with another device. And I know you have used Nimbus. What's your personal experience with it? Well, this is about my, my experience. So far we've done 62 cases where we used it as, an, uh, as a rescue device after we failed with our standard technique, which is normally a stent retriever and aspiration at the same time. Uh, and we have about a 55% overall Nimbus uh, result. So this seems to be the number that, that uh, everyone uh, has. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you.